Click subscribe to get daily Manchester United content from Passionate Reds, only on All for United. Welcome back to All for United. It's another special Busby Babe show in collaboration with the Manchester Munich Memorial Foundation. And look, he's back. COVID couldn't keep him down. Patrick Burns is back <laughs> on with us. Roy Kavanagh, MBE, is here as well. Uh, good to have you boys alongside me. And our best wishes to Tom Clare as well, who's, um, who's yes. a little bit under the yeah. weather but, um, over in the States. Uh, he can't join us today. But um, Tom, we love you and hopefully yeah. you'll be back on very, very soon indeed. Uh, yeah. Patrick, you missed a good one last week. You missed a really good one last week. Um, it was really good to sit down I, um... and, and have a chat about Sir Bobby. I watched it. I enjoyed it. It was fantastic. Really, really, oh, really thank good. You, thank you, mate. And what about Roy? Was he all right on it? Was he all right? He's brilliant. <laughs> he's oh, always, cool he's always brilliant. I thought, uh, I thought I thought the little thing he had going on with Pete Molyneux was good. You know, nice little... Good Did you have a relation? I enjoyed that. It was, I, 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 went, I went through the show and I thought, well, there's, there's probably not very much that I would have been able to have. <laughs> To that, apart from the fact that he had a shot like an Exocet missile, um, which he did. Well, apart yeah. from that, it was uh, it was it was brilliant. A proper uh, nice testimony to Sir Bobby. I just, do you know say what? Roy. Go on, Roy. I was just going to say, Ben. I, um, I woke up the following morning, and I actually it's quite weird. I actually learned stuff about Bobby in my own mind, and I changed. I'd actually changed slight opinions as well after that show um, and it was just the you know it was just it was just the the level of what he actually had done and won from junior reserve champions <laughs> FA cup european cup world cup top goal scorer yeah. top goal scorer top appearances top of, and it was like wow roy and, and because i i you know um and because Law, for example, is such a such a great guy, so relaxed. He, he's he's not up himself at all. He's he's great, great company. George was the greatest footballer still I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And Bobby was, was Dar is not the right word. That's unfair. But he didn't oh, put himself. Up. Yeah, yeah. But I, I the, the show really changed my opinion of him, which I thought crikey, it's changed my opinion. I don't know anyone who's listening to it. It's um, yeah, yeah. And and do you know I, what I, I found I, interesting about yeah. that show, Roy? It was it was a tough balance because obviously, and I hope this comes across the right way. It wasn't a tribute show because luckily, Sir Bobby's still with us. It was more yes. a reflection on his yes. career and an ability to be able to learn about <coughs> why. Sir Bobby Cholton is Mr. Manchester United and the foundation yeah. and the cornerstone to our football club today. And I think, Patrick, yeah. you would have seen this, and you know I don't get like this on shows, but I got quite passionate and a little bit emotional yeah. chatting about why mm. Sir Bobby isn't mentioned as one of the greatest footballers of, of all time but because he's, he's numbered. He's not mentioned, he say but, but he is. I, I, I would say, I mean, yeah. I, I'm, I, I fall into the same camp as Roy. When I, when I was a boy watching the Trinity, it was always Georgie and Dennis, but Bobby Charlton never got a look in. He wasn't. Yeah. He wasn't charismatic. He wasn't. No, no. You know. He, he wasn't. Um, he, he didn't have. He didn't have what Georgie and Dennis had. Uh, but when I look back in the cold light of day and listen to some of those things, I'm thinking, "What mm -hmm. hell?" He really was a marvelous. And I think I said in one of my contacts with you post meeting it at five foot seven, which is all he was. Mm -hmm. That's a midget by today's standards, yeah. and yet his presence <coughs> on the field was statuesque. He was, mm. he was a huge presence. But I, I would still say, if you spoke to any football fan around the world to name the twenty greatest footballers that have ever lived, Bobby Charlton would be in. Yeah, virtually yeah. Everybody's I, I, I think, about. I think, I think that's debatable on generation, and that's what I think is really sad. I think if yeah. you went and asked any. Of so to speak, say my this isn't no disrespect to you guys, my age, so twenties to thirties, maybe even push it up to thirty five, maybe forty even. And that's a big bracket when you think about it. And tell them to name the, the twenty greatest players of all time. I'm actually going to disagree with you, Pat. I think Sir Bobby Cholton gets actually overlooked mm. in ten to mm. fifteen of those twenty yeah. people's 
20 players. Yeah, and that's <laughs> that's why I got quite thingy about it because mm. I sat here listening to the stories and looking at the accolades, looking at the numbers and, and learning more about the man and the player yeah. and what he did. He should be in the top five. Like, he mm. genuinely should be in the top five, especially if what you're a Manchester to, United fan. What jumped out to me listening to it was the fact that we, we, we actually got we, we got all we got over in the show that um what he thought about the club that when he played every game for Manchester yeah. United he put Manchester United first yeah and I yes. thought that was a very telling statement when you look around today well that leads us on Roy very very nicely because Pat then talking about the figure of the man that Sir Bobby was you talking about him putting Manchester United mm. first and today's Busby Bay special by the way uh, please go back and check out the Sir Bobby Charlton special it was just quite it's magnificent amazing. and there's loads mm. of other great shows there on Duncan Edwards the late great Harry Gregg Tommy Taylor so many go and check them out today we're all about Roger Byrne the leader the enigma the the, the man on the pitch that led the babes uh, quite magnificently as well. He was a captain of the Babes, and out of all the stories after the Munich tragedy, tragedy, his is one that stands out. I mean, obviously, we've heard about some of the stories of players pulling other players out of out of the wreckage, but Roger Burns' story is a little bit more personal than that. And and I think Roy, you wanted to hit on on one of these as well. I mean, there's quite a personal edge to this in terms of. Roger's wife finding out that she was pregnant whilst he was actually mm. in Belgrade. And Roger yeah. never knew. He had a son called yeah. Roger Jr. to yeah. come out of that. And she had to obviously go on and, and you know, have without having <coughs> Roger on his side. But he, he never knew. So it just goes to show the personal connection that sometimes all, Tom also gets overlooked in this tragedy. It wasn't just a tragedy of a football club. It was a, it was a mm. tragedy of man, wasn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, he, um, you know, the social media wasn't around there. You know, people are not going to be ringing up from Belgrade <laughs> and saying how, what the weather's like and, and how life is, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, when you leave home in those days to go and play in Europe for United on a Monday morning, um, when you hopefully you get back Thursday, Thursday afternoon or so, that was the next time people would hopefully see you or hear about you. Um, you know, and and she she was she found out she was pregnant while he was in Belgrade, and and the son was called Roger Junior. What's even more tragic? Well, not tragic because he did live quite an hour, but he, I think he was in his early fifties, very early fifties when he when he passed away. And I, I remember him coming on the pitch. I think it was the fortieth anniversary. He came on. I think we played Bolton Wanderers and. Uh, him and that lockdown came out and, and laid uh, reef, etc. Um, yeah. Well, that was the last time I saw him because uh, I'd been to the cathedral the night before. They'd had a, a 40th anniversary uh, event at Manchester Cathedral. Um, but he died in his early 50s. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, a sad, yeah, he, sad it, story to come away from Munich. You, yeah. you, talk, you talk about, um, which is why. You know, we we don't we don't just focus on the eight babes. We focus on the twenty three souls, and we focus on the survivors and their families too. And and it's quite a personal tragedy. This because Joy, his wife, you know, she's found out that her husband's passed away. Then she finds out that she's pregnant with his child. And then, you know, as as he grows up as a young man, I've seen pictures of him. God, he was like his dad. He was a handsome, mm. handsome man. Mm. Um, and he was actually, uh, at one point, he wrote to Matt Busby and asked if he could be a ball boy. And he was a ball boy at Old Trafford, Roger G. Yeah, yeah. And then, sadly, he died of cancer in 2011. Um, mm. I am, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, later on this year, going to get to meet his wife, Gillian, Roger's daughter-in-law. She's mm. going to come. Uh, hopefully, she'll be with me and Roy and, and many others at our next dinner. But it's um, it's a it's a tragedy that touched many many lives and not just mm. the eight Busby babes. Mm -hmm. We must yeah. forget and, that. And 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 do you know what? When it comes to the babes, the backstory of them, but also we'll find out more about Roger Byrne off the pitch during the show. We'll also learn more about Roger Byrne on the pitch during the show today. Mm. But let's start it. I mean, we're 10 minutes in, but let's let's start it now, really. Um, although we've already started with the question I always <coughs> ask 
very start. And Patrick, I'll come to you first on this. Obviously, Roy saw him play. You've learned a lot about the babes over your time being the chairman of the Manchester Munich Memorial Foundation, knowing the families, knowing the players inside out. Um, Roger Byrne, when I mention that name to you, what, what first comes to mind? How would you describe Roger Byrne? Oh, um, there's, there's a lot going to come out here. Be- before, before I talk about that, can I, can I do a shout out? Am I allowed to do that? Can Only I, if it's for me. Can I shout out to all the Gorton Reds? Because they are a breed apart, these men. They are proud Mancunians and proud Gortonians. And they love Roger Byrne with all their heart. And there's some great there's some great lads. There's a lad called Mick Kirkham and all his pals. They're all in the 70s. They go to Munich every year. Les Park, Jay and Ryan Daly. Gorton turns out in numbers every year at Munich to pay their respects because they are so, so proud of Roger Byrne. Mm. And, and what Roger do I Jimmy. think of? When I, when I hear his name, I see I see a light come on which says Roger Byrne, our worthy captain. Because it's the lyrics from the Flowers of Manchester and every time I hear the name Roger Byrne, I finish it off in my head with our worthy captain. Because he was, he was an absolute beast of a footballer, believe it or not. He didn't, he didn't start out like, like most kids. He probably started out playing football with his mates, with his school, in his youth club. And that's where, that's where he was spotted by, by the one and only Joe Armstrong. He didn't sign for United till he was 20. For 20 years of age, he's playing Sunday League football for Ryder Brown in Gorton. And ends up playing for Manchester United. So he signed in 1949. And I think, you know, early part of this conversation, within two to three years, he's the vice captain of Manchester United. And then he goes on to be the captain because he had such charisma, such determination, such leadership. I, I often think of all the footage that I watch of the babes. And every time you see the babes running out, you see Roger Byrne carrying a football, focused, determined, and most of all proud, you know, for a young Mancunian lad to get signed by his, his boy yes. team. And, and, and we, you know, we probably don't speak about the Mancunians in the team, you know, Jeff and Eddie and, and, and Roger, but they, they were three Mancunians. And it must have been careful, Pat. South Audians. <laughs> well, yeah. South Audians, you know, local lads is what right. I mean. So that's so that's what I think of Roger Byrne. Um, I mean, I know we'll we'll, we'll talk in in due course, and we'll make some comparisons to modern day footballers of the type of of player he was. But let's say first and foremost, he was. A protector, he was an enforcer, and if anybody wanted to take liberties with the young babes, it was Roger Byrne who was coming in to sort it out. He has he has my utmost respect for his mm. leadership style and his qualities. Well said. Well, my um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 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 Can you read this about? Yeah, yeah. I my mic's decided to disconnect itself. So I'm going to have to go and get my headphones because it's not working. Roy, let me come over to you. Same question to Patrick. When you first think of Roger Byrne, what comes to mind to, for, for you? Calm, an influencer, and a world-class fullback. Mm. World-class fullback. Mm. Where does he rank then? You put this in your meeting notes, to be fair, Roy. You put this in your meeting rank, uh, notes. Where does he rank for you in all-time Manchester United fullbacks? Um, well, I, th- I think what's uh, interesting, it's always worth remembering that Manchester United's history did not start in the year 2000 or 1980 or 1950. In Manchester United from 1902 and, of course, Newton Heath prior to that from 1878. So you're going a long, long time. And um, for the position of number three, the left-back position, Roger Byrne arguably, arguably, is the finest left-back Manchester United have had. And I think because of his captaincy skills, 
which would put him without a shadow of a doubt in the top three, four, maximum of five, seriously, captains of the club back whenever. Uh, it just tips it. I just like to go into a modern idiom here because um, Dennis Irwin deserves a lot, of, a lot of praise because Dennis Irwin is a magnificent fullback. And if you're ever wanting to pick your best 11, my two fullbacks in my Manchester United best 11 mm -hmm. are Johnny Carey at number two and Roger Byrne at three. Those are mine. But you've got your Dennis Irwins and, and, and you've got many others. But Roger Byrne was without a shadow of a doubt. Magnificent captain, superb leader and a world-class left back. What's funny, Pat? It's it's just like I'm I'm sure if I if I went back I'd find that this man is related to me at some point. I'll I'll just <laughs> read you some of my notes. Hugely respected captain, this edges it. In my all time top United team, think of left backs, and I'm thinking of ones that I've seen as well. So Tony Dunn, magnificent. Mm. Irwin, just outstanding. Evra, Albiston, Ainsey, Martin. He beats them all because of the fact that he was a respected captain. Mm. And he's in my all-time top United team, in my back four. But I put Johnny Carey over at right back, because Johnny Carey could play anywhere. Mm. And Roger, he was tried out as an outside left as a winger and, and as a wing half back where Eddie Coleman used to play and he didn't like it. In fact, he kicked off. <clears throat> he, had, he had that sort of, he had, he had I, I won't say he had a, a, a brittle temperament, but he knew what was right and what was wrong. And he was a bit of a, a bit of a shop steward from what I can pick up from things that I've read about him. He had mm. no compunction in, in, in getting hold of, of Alan B. Chilton, the captain, or, or Matt Busby, and telling them what he thought. Um, he was almost sent home once from a, from a, a foreign trip because he kicked off with some opposing players. So he knew, he knew how to speak his mind. Um, but if you were going to compare him to a modern-day player, if it was a full-back, it would be Dennis Irwin. Mm. But you could also add in Robson, Keane, and Cantona, because he had a steal about him. And just mm -hmm. like those three men I've just mentioned, if anybody mess with their teammates, you know, think of Roy Keane in the tunnel with Vieira when he was threatening Gary Neville. Think of, I was reading, I'm sure I was reading Neil Berry's book on, on Johnny Berry recently, and he talks about a time when Ryan Giggs came in field and said to Robson, the fullback was going to break his legs. So Robson went out on the wing, come back in again to midfield and said to Giggsy, don't worry, mate, it's sorted. He won't go anywhere near you. <laughs> and, and then Canton are standing up for the Reds at Swindon as well and, and many, many other occasions. Byrne was that kind of player. So mm. as well as being a gifted player, a gifted fullback that could support um, an attack, a midfield wasn't just there to defend, he was a link, a great link man as well. Uh, pretty much like Irwin and Everett, up and down the field, up and down the field. Great discipline, mm -hmm. great vision, could read a game. And, you, and, and you'll read things like, his, his tackling was a bit suspect. Yeah, whatever, so was Paul Scholes. He's, you know, he, he wasn't great in the air. He, he was five foot nine, so he was a bit bigger than Charlton. Um but he more than made up for those with those, those other attributes, those other qualities mm -hmm. where he was just a winner and, and do, no do one know, was messing with him. Do you, know, do you know, Patrick, you mentioned about his natural leadership skills and the fact that no one's going to mess with him. And looking at his backstory, he obviously, as a, as a kid, had to serve. Um, I read that about him, that he was in the National Service in the, in the Royal Air Force. He also wasn't <coughs> good enough to play football at the very start, so played a lot of rugby. Uh, throughout his youthful times. It sounds like all of those experiences and the toughness is what sort of moulded him into being that captain figure and, and to have that personality that you're talking about, the, a leader of men and someone who very much takes pride of those boys who go to battle with him. 
Absolutely, yeah. I mean, Roy, Roy will talk now probably about 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 Duncan and Bobby. They served in the army, but see, he he was um, he was Air Force Roger, and considered not good enough to play football for the Air Force. But you know, thankfully, <laughs> United didn't think. Um, but yeah, he would have got that discipline um, mm. and, and and been exposed to that kind of leadership post war in the Air Force. Um, but you know, many people. Gorton is sort of inner city East Manchester, uh, Openshaw, Beswick, Gorton, West Gorton. They, 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 these are hard breeding grounds uh, in the, in the northwest of England. You know, you can't you can't be soft and survive in places like that. So that's that's where he would have got that from in his upbringing as well. Mm -hmm. And those are the attributes that made him one of United's greatest ever captains. Um, Roy, quickly, and you can feel free to just jump onto that as well. But I do want to just quickly read this bit out here. And I've, I've copied and pasted it. And I don't usually read straight from Wikipedia, nor do I usually use it. Um, but I think it just um, it amplifies what you've both been saying mm. about Roger Byrne's attributes. It said, Byrne was never considered the most gifted of footballers. His tackling could be suspect and his aerial ability was described as no better than average. Mm. But his incredible work ethic and footballing intelligence allowed him to position himself and react to danger swiftly. I mean, he gets straight in the United first team today. Innovatively, he was also adept at making forward runs and joining attacks at a time when fullbacks were expected only to stand back and defend. I get the feeling from that and listening to you guys and as someone, Roy, who is in, in, in watching him play, potentially in the stands, with him, with Roger Byrne, was he a breath of fresh air at the time? Because it sounded like he was very different to other fullbacks and maybe even ahead of his time with that attacking attribute that he had. Yeah, and I think the defensive um, critique of, of Roger there is a bit unjust on Wikipedia because, um, for example, Matthews was rated as the greatest outside right around. Matthews sometimes didn't play in matches when Manchester United played. And if he did, I, I can never, ever remember a game where Stanley Matthews went past more than once. He didn't go past him twice in any game. I think what's significant as well to give a, a really breadth, wider breadth of um, of how good he was. If you, if you, or people may not know this, but if you take the period 1954-58 when he played for England, in those days, uh, Walter Winterbottom was the coach. He wasn't the manager, he was the coach. And Walter Winterbottom was presented with a team and travelling reserves. He didn't pick the team. The England team, until Sir Alf Ramsey came along, was picked by the chairman of um, on, a, on a, a revolving basis of around seven or eight football league first mm -hmm. division sides. That's who picked the England team. And the team they picked over a nice glass of wine and something nice to eat. And, uh, and don't forget, Italy. well, hang on, my club's not had a player for England for a long while. But let's put him in. And, and whatever. It was that type of thing. And the names were then given to the Walter Winterbottom oh. of this world to, 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 to uh, turn them into a team and, 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 and play the game. Roger Burns from 1954 oh. till his uh, tragic death in 1958 had just played the last 33 consecutive oh. internationals for England. I, I mean, he didn't miss a game. So these people who would change on selection committees had him every time um, as number three. So, you know, he, he must have made that impression on, on, other, on other players. And there's no doubt that the, three, the loss of the three of them, Duncan, Tommy and Roger, the more you think about that and the more you read about that, and I can remember the time of the 1958 World Cup in Sweden. Mm -hmm. Um, England was so, so close to winning that with the team that should have been there because Duncan, Roger and Tommy in the team at that time, England were playing quite well. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the game, the World Cup was in Europe, it was in Sweden. Um, so the, the European sides had an advantage. England over the previous uh, four years had beaten West Germany with the World Cup holders from 1954. They'd beat them at Wembley and in Berlin. 
up, they beat Brazil at Wembley 4 2. Uh, and Roger played in all of those games. Uh, he was he was a quite magnificent left back. And um, quickly, Roy, on on that England on that England appearance record that you mentioned, that's still a record today. So that that record still lives and breathes yeah. today. Um, and on top of that, the one thing that I do love is in those thirty three games, it makes clear that he didn't score a goal, but he took two penalties during his England career and missed them. So for all these greats, he wasn't the great from the spot, was he? No, Roger he wasn't. He wasn't a great penalty taker. I mean, I, I just done a book for for Pat and, and his magnificent charity, which uh, will come out when Pat wants it to do. Um, there it is, and that's to raise funds purely for their um, their marvelous charity, and that's the report. Let's do a show. Is- specifically on that book really show specifically on that book let's do one let's push let's, it out let's there promote it, it. Oh, yeah it's, yeah i think it's coming out Listen, in yeah. the, united champions city are defeated i mean what yeah. more do you want and it, it covers every single every single match really that they played the 42 league games as a report the one fa cup tie uh and any friendly that they played and any game that players played in representative mode uh, they're, they're all included in uh, the reserves are mentioned and I, i'm pretty sure the youth teams are mentioned as well now um roger was the leader but he, he did have problems taking penalties and there's an interesting one in that season the the vital game in the end it wasn't that vital because they won the title by 11 points but the first title of the busby babes was 1956 and Blackpool had been the only side that had really chased them all season. And we played them uh, early April, about three games to go, that's all, at Old Trafford. And um, Blackpool scored early on, and then United equalised, and then they got a penalty, United. And Roger, we're extolling his leadership virtues. And, and Now, this is an interesting one. He picked the ball up and he gave it to Johnny Berry <laughs> <laughs> because he'd missed two or three penalties, Roger. And so there's leadership. You're the man, John. <laughs> and walks away and Berry put the ball down, put the ball in there. United won 2-1. Um, <coughs> you know, he, he was a... I hate using the man's man scenario. Yeah. But Pat, Pat mentioned it marvellously. You know, if you're looking at the ages of Eddie Coleman at 21, Duncan at 21, Billy Whelan at 21, Bobby Charlton uh, around then, 18 to 20, 18, Tommy yeah. Taylor, 23, um, you know, David Pegg, 21, 22. There was only uh, really um, Ray Wood, who was a bit older, uh, Johnny, Johnny Berry, and Roger Byrne. Uh, and, you know, every one of them, might take a, a gamble, might take a, a little bit of a liberty. But if Roger said, Oi, that was enough. He was yeah. the lead. And, you I know, mean, like, going back to the Bobby oh, sorry, thing. Sorry, yes. Sorry, going back to the Bobby thing last week. It's such a shame that when you, you think of today, when everyone's got, in a plain sense, a footballer's got everything, financial security for life, all that type of thing. The ethos of that's your club and we shall not be beaten. You know, the Nobby Styles influence, that, that, that yeah. type of thing. Yeah. People, Pat mentioned there, uh, Keane and, and Robson in, in later times, recent times, really. But, you know, there was the pride of playing for that, for the club um, and how great you were as individuals. It was your team, and, you know, mm-hmm. and Roger mm-hmm. Byrne ep- epitomised it, in my opinion. Well, it was. I was going to say a great thing to say just quickly, Pat, is a lot of people <coughs> are saying we're missing a Brian Robson, we're ris- missing a Roy Keane, but we're missing a Roger Byrne as well. And there's another yeah, name that absolutely. should naturally come yeah. out and be said. Sorry, Patrick, absolutely. do you want to carry on? No, I was going to say in, 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 in relation to the England setup, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm right in thinking, Roy, that he was earmarked as the next England captain after oh, yeah. the great Bobby Wright. Absolutely. And that was how, how well regarded he was. Um, absolutely you know an, an absolute outstanding leader i mean I was, I was looking at my notes again and i've, I've got down here compare him to dennis Irwin, a right-footed player playing at left back 
Mm. I mean, you, you couldn't write it, could you? And mm. I put Irwin better at pens, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah, very much so, very much so. But didn't, you know, didn't stop him. Didn't stop him taking penalties. No, no, he took penalties. Um, oh no, but he missed some. <laughs> he did. Yeah. He also he, he also led the team to winning winning titles and winning trophies. And even when he first came into the side, he am I right in saying he went on to win a title medal that season as well? So he's used to some yeah. glory at, at United too. Yeah. Um, Pat, let me let me come over to you in terms of of Roger Byrne and. And his trophy collection and, and obviously his time at United, I think, what, 279, 280 appearances. Um, he was very much one of the first names on the, the team sheet, wasn't he, from the day of his debut? He was ever present. You can look at look at mm. the look at the stats through those six and a half seasons. You can see that the, the 20 games halfway through the start of his career. I think that was 51, 52 when they won the league. And then obviously we hadn't finished 57, 58. But the seasons in between, you know, those those five full seasons, he's an ever-present. I think there was only Ray Wood and possibly Mark Jones who played more than him in mm. the 55, 56 championship mm. team. So in a very short space of a don't forget he didn't he didn't start playing for United till he was 20. Sadly, passed away by the time he's twenty-eight, and in 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 those six seven years, he's won he's won three league titles. You know, in our in our post-war era, setting us up to. I mean, we've said this a number of times in the earlier shows. You know, we were on we were on a mission to take Real Madrid's European crown. I'm I'm pretty sure Roger Byrne was on that self same mission, and all the Busby babes. Under, under Busby's direction, they knew exactly what they were doing. They were going to be the greatest team in Europe without question. And mm. he's won three charity shields as well at the same time. So in a very short career, in a very tough time for English football and, you know, stretching out into European football, he's, he's proved what a class act he is right throughout that period for me anyway. That, that's why he's always going to get into my... You know, I, I, I know, I know Dennis Irwin. Uh, you know, I, I'd have no compunction in saying to him, "Sorry, mate, you didn't, you didn't quite make the all-time top team." Can, God, can, God, can we have just... that the next show? Can we have that the next show? We do just Dennis Irwin and you chatting about why he doesn't make you. <laughs> <laughs> mate, Dennis is a top bloke as well, isn't he? I mean, as a bloke. Well, I, I, I have to say that I've got uh, I've got a letter that's gone to Mr. Irwin through Manchester United Football Club. Uh, kindly offering him a patronage of the charity. So I'm waiting mm, to oh, hear, lovely. but I don't want to offend him because I love him to be still Dennis Irving. Mm. I can't but, believe you uh, just haven't picked up the phone and asked him for a pint. Well, there's, there's, you can you can go to any pub in Altrincham and ask, he sounds like an alky, but yeah, I used to I used to, to drink in Altrincham with my friends, and you, you'd be you'd be in the pub having a drink. But Denny Sermon would walk in with two or three mates and just sit down and have a couple of beers and a laugh with you across the table. He's of he's of that that sort of that ilk, that genre, where they knew they knew how important it was to have that connection mm -hmm. with the fans. You you build that rapport, you build that relationship. Uh, and I've seen footage of Roger Byrne coming out of Old Trafford, straight over to the kids, wanting to sign the autographs, patting them on the head. You know, a kind word it, it means it means so much to to a, to a young lad who's just starting to follow his heroes, and mm. there's one of them walking out the door and and giving him an autograph and patting him on the head. You know, what, what I mean, it sounds the other, like the it sounds like Roger Byrne t treated the kids outside Old Trafford better than Matt's garden wall. Roy, you've put something yeah, here what? in the notes that I've got a hit on. What what's yeah. this story? Yeah, he, he was. He, he got his L plates on, and he was. Uh, he, he lived quite close to Matt, and um, Matt and Jean, and uh, they're in the house, uh, and could be a bit of ice. And Rogers come round, come round the corner, and skidded, and he's, he's crashed his car right into the into the garden wall. Matt's gone out, and there's uh, a contrite club captain of his behind the car. I mean, it's, it's incredible, but it's a true story. He, uh, Can you imagine he, the, next, the next day? Well, I mean, yeah. the next day, you'd be scared that you won't be in the next team. 
you, just going back onto the, the point there you, you were making about his, his number of appearances and his consistency, let's put it this way. Jeff Bent, you don't have to believe me. I mean, p- people who, who saw him, Jeff Bent was a beautiful left fullback, a really top, top left fullback. Jeff Bent probably played 12 games in, in about six years at United. Because then, and don't forget the number of times that when England played a game on a Saturday, which certainly would have been the Scotland game every year, and would certainly have been either the Wales or Ireland game at the beginning of the season. Every time they missed a game, but sorry, they had to, the clubs had to carry on playing. So, you know, Jeff, those are the chances that he had. The number of times that Roger was out because he, he'd hurt himself. I mean, even the, the ultimate tragedy for Jeff Bent, of course, mm-hmm. was that Roger did, did get a bad knock in the in the famous match at Highbury, the 5-4 victory on the 1st of February. And there was a doubt whether he would have been fit or not to have played on the, on the Wednesday. And obviously, yeah. Busby and the team, Roger was all, really, I assume, going to always take the field with one leg, effectively because of his inspiring uh, and his influence on, on, the, on the team. But at the last minute on the Sunday, um, someone went round to Jeff Bent's house while he was having a, a couple of glasses with his mate in Earl and the Eye, an area of Salford, and, and said we, a message for, for Jeff. He's actually travelling to Belgrade tomorrow because, Roger, there is a doubt about him. And Ronnie Cope should have been the, the player who was going Earmark for fullback cover, and um, Roger was uh, so um, Colt Ronnie Colt was taken off the plane, and Jeff Bent went onto the plane, and you know the number of times mm-hmm. I can remember that story from a, from a mate of his who'd had a drink with him that Sunday lunchtime, mm-hmm. probably mm-hmm. gave a kiss. We know as folks did in those days, and you know Jeff saying right, yeah, I'll see you Wednesday night as normal, going home. And and finding out from his wife that he better get his boots ready. He's he's playing. Uh, he's playing in. in well, sorry, he's going with the team to Belgrade. And uh, but of course, Roger did play. And I think that picture Pat summed it up before any game. You see Roger coming out. But I think that game at Highbury, when he when he's coming out of that little tunnel at Highbury, and they were in all white that day, of course, and they had the black armband for George Whitaker, the um, the uh, one of Director. the directors. Had died the night before in his 80s. And Rogers coming round there out of that tunnel with the ball in his hand, and he's got that look on his face. He's not coming out thinking, oh, he's coming out there, ball, game, kick off, we're going to win. And, you know, it's just this. It's, it's like, we, like we were saying, there's, there's so many sort of <coughs> threads and uh, that, that run to the tragedy. So, yeah, you've got. Jeff Bent called up for cover for Roger. He was never used. Um, I'm sure that Roger and Jeff actually moved to the back of the aeroplane where they felt they'd be safer. Mm. And Johnny Berry and Jackie Blanchflower came up with Harry Gregg up to the front mm. um, where, they, where they felt they'd be safer there. And we were just talking about Mr. Whitaker passing away. That's why none of the directors went on that trip. Mm. Uh, it's why Willie Satanoff, who was an incumbent director, a director in waiting, he went to represent the Manchester United board on that trip. Oh, so when I, I'm very much in Tom Clare's camp. When I, when I read, you know, Willie Satanoff was a fan. Yeah, yeah, he might have been. But he was an awful lot more than that. He was yeah. really the next director of Manchester United yeah. Football Club. So you're always yeah. going to find these little these little mm. threads that run off it, and everybody's mm. got everybody's got mm. their own impacts. And you know, we've spoke about we spoke about Joy Byrne and finding out she was carrying Roger's baby. Uh, it, a son he never got to meet. A boy never got to meet his dad. You know, Gillian never got. A son to he meet never him. knew he was going to have. No, exactly. You never knew he was going to have, yeah. you know, um, so many lives impacted by it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, yeah. it's an absolute, it's an absolute tragedy, whichever way you look at it. But there's always mm. personal stories that that underpin 
the whole the whole <laughs> game of the Munich just, Audis. Just picking up another thing, Ben, that Pat mentioned before about um, the services, you know, the Army and the, the Navy uh, and, and the Air Force. Uh, and it's, uh, again, an often forgotten or unknown um, point that when people had to do the national service for two years in the forces, they then became employed by that service. So if you were a school teacher or a Manchester United footballer, once you became an air forceman or in the army, you actually were employed by the army or the air force, not by your school, not by your education, not by your football club. And to, to play, they, they had to actually get permission to play. And if, if the, the army, for example, I'm sure it was saying the air force, because I think it was the army did actually play more matches than the other two. But the army, I'd first call on them. And I know of at least two occasions when the army were playing a game, when Manchester United were playing a game, and the players, certainly Billy Folks, Duncan Edwards and Eddie Coleman in one case, uh, were told, no, you're playing for the British army in Brussels against the Belgium army. When United that afternoon were playing Luton Town in the middle of February, going for that 56 title, Pat, in that book, and, uh, you know, three players taken out of the team because they were going to have to play. And as it happened, the weather was that bad in Brussels, that game didn't take place when United luckily won 2-0. So, you know, there's all those aspects of what life was around and like in those times. You, um, I want to use the word angelically. You you painted a lovely picture of Roger Byrne coming out of the tunnel at it would it would have been Highbury, wouldn't it? Yeah, uh, out the yeah. tunnel uh, at Arsenal, and that sticking with you as a as a vivid memory. Well, mm. I'd love to know, Roy, and I'm sure Patrick would love to hear some. Any other memories you have that come to mind when you think of watching Roger Byrne play? Is there were there any moments in games where you're watching and thinking? As soon as he flicks that switch, the game changes. Is is there a certain? I don't know. We talk about his poor tackling, but in terms of you know, which well, is unkind, you said anyway, yeah, a tackle I, or I, anything. I, I honestly um, don't remember him making a. Um, you know, I mean, there were a lot of the hard men around at the time. The Bolton fullbacks, uh, Tommy Banks and Roy Hartle, were renowned for their hardness. But you know, Rod, Roger Byrne to me, I think Pat again mentioned it early on. It was anticipation. Roger Byrne had looked across wherever the ball's over there, it's going to land there. I'm going there. Now, if you happen to be there or whatever, he's going through and winning the ball. I thought he had a calmness about him. Um, it, 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 you know, it, to me, he won ball. He was able to go over the halfway line because in those days, you know, really, teams had three defenders, three defenders. They had number two, number three, and number five. And they rarely cross the halfway line. Number seven and number 11 and number nine hardly cross the halfway line coming this way. They were going, they were going forward. So, you know, Roger was one of the first ones that would go in this overlap. And he was an, an excellent crosser of a ball as well, which was always handy when he got a, a Tommy Taylor stood around the penalty spot. If someone could float a ball across onto his head. No, no, to me, um, he was, he was an outstanding player because he was always there as a player. He was commanding as a player. You instantly, as a young kid, like in those days, you had ultra respect for the police, for example. You, wouldn't, you, had, you had respect for the parky in, in, the, in the local parks. You know, you think, oh, no, the park is here. You looked at us, <laughs> you, knew, you knew he was Manchester United's captain. And, you know, I've mentioned it before, and, and, and I'm not denigrating how magnificent a footballer Duncan Edwards was at all, because he was without doubt at 21 on the cusp of being the greatest footballer possibly ever seen. But sadly, Duncan's career was 16 to 21, and he was, but he was part of a great team. And one of the parts of that great team was at number three, the club had a great left back, top, top class, mm -hmm. 
who also was a top, top class captain. You know, and then you, you start going on to Taylor, you start going on to other players. And, you know, they were a complete team and he was the leader. His debut, all by that, the way. Sorry, Ross. No, so, so, no, no, and neither of you have to comment on this, but I'm just going to say it out loud anyway. And if one of you do want to, then you can do. How did the United documentary get it so wrong? Well, well oh, it, yes. I mean, it just literally, I mean, and some people will know what I'm talking about with that, by the way. And uh, yeah. I don't know how much, but basically, Roger Byrne was, was left more or less completely out of it. And they represented uh, someone yeah. else as captain of Manchester United. I know. They got it so wrong. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's it's just I mean it's it's just it's 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 scandals. I mean, it really is. Uh, I mean it's it's you know these it, words can't describe it. I mean it's just you look at it and you think, well no, because sorry to keep repeating it, but that team was Wood, Folks, Byrne, Coleman, Jones, Edwards, Berry, Whelan, Taylor, Val, and Plague. That was the eleven, the main eleven, but there were others that stepped in. You know, Jackie Blanchflower was very nearly. Uh, uh, you know, he was the perfect 12 because you didn't have substitutes in those days. Um, but he could play anywhere. But Roger was the captain. And how to do that? I mean, if someone had said to me, you know, write a docket or explain to me uh, what Manchester United were like between 1954 and 55. Um, the main players, to me, in order, in order, would have been Roger Byrne, would have been... Tommy Taylor, Stroke, Duncan Edwards, that's three of them. Those would be the, the three. But Dennis Violet, I'd be then saying, oh, Dennis Violet. And then I'd be saying, oh, Billy Paul. Billy Whelan. But Billy Whelan, Eddie Coleman, my hero, the goalkeeper, Ray Wood. I mean, they were all integral parts. Harry. So you, you got the round holes and the ball went into each of those holes. That was the team, perfect team. Perfect, Patrick. Perfect. Uh, would you mind if I push you for a little word on that? Because as the chairman of the Manchester Munich Memorial Foundation, of course, you part of your job and a big part of the role within the the, the company. Obviously, you or not company or the charity is that you support, and and obviously you also want to keep the legacies alive. And obviously, mm. that's one of the reasons why we do these shows. And you know, and anyone who's going off of that documentary for their, so to speak, um, education. <laughs> around the babes or or the munich disaster obviously there was a big oversight there a huge big oversight so how how do we rectify that as fans and keep burns burns name shining so so bright in the history of this football club we speak the truth we don't we don't we don't gloss it we we say for what it is you know they they, they are they are immortalized but they're immortalized for a reason and whoever whoever was sort of consulting on that particular film, who got that so wrong, um, should hang their head in shame. You, know, you can you can go on to manchesterunited.com and you can you can look at um, you know a biography of every player. Um, I was looking at what they had to say about Roger, and it's a really brilliant write up. Now, that's on our own football club. Now, if you can't go to your own football club and read what they've got to say, or you can't buy a book that's written by someone who has dedicated their lives to Manchester United and the Busby Babes, the, 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 the materials out there, you know, you can even... Wikipedia makes reference to that, that incorrect... Um, claim that Mark Jones was the captain uh, and, and corrects it. So all I'm saying is people can be they can be as lazy as they want and just listen to stuff or they can just be a little bit proactive because there are great organisations out there. There's great information out there. And, you know, like, like, like people like Roy and Tom, Wayne Barton, um, Carl, Carl Abbott, Ian McCartney. There's, there's people who have written some fantastic accounts from players' perspectives as well. Um, you know, Neil Berry wrote one from his own dad's perspective. Mm. So the, mm. the information's out there that you can find if you're not... Mm -hmm. If you just want to sit back and consume banal rubbish, then that's all you're going to have in your head. You know, what, what we do, what we do here, 
I think is is absolutely brilliant because for years to come, both on All for United and on the Manchester Munich Memorial Foundation, we will have a library, we will have a catalogue, a testimony to our conversations about these great, great people. And I always I always come on these shows and I'm absolutely honoured just just to be part of it, just to 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 say that, yeah, you know, people people want to listen to, to what you do, what you say, what your views are. Um, and it's it's it helps to protect and preserve the legacy in the right way because we're not we're not glossing over it, we're not sugarcoating it. Um, we say and, and we're very lucky to have people like Roy and Tom who mm-hmm. in their childhoods were able to see these great, great footballers and we can keep an account for everybody to, to, to pick yeah. up on these. You know, read read and the books. You know, read the books. Don't don't just listen to, to nonsense that you see on social media and things <laughs> like that. Do you know I was, I was going through as well? We had um before we had Brian on. Do you remember when we had Brian on? Uh, Molly, we we've had Rose from the uh we've had Rose on yeah. as well from the Duncan Edwards um museum and foundation. We've had Paul Murphy on as well. Um, you know, to chat about Jimmy Murphy. We we we've been blessed with the people that we get on to be able to talk about the 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 people, the guys, the foundations of Manchester United that will always be there and as you say, immortal in all of our eyes. And I think the interesting the interesting conversation now around around Roger Byrne is a similar one to that we had um, last week about Sir Bobby Cholton, just maybe on a on a slightly elevated scale in terms of there, we was asking the question, well, are we here potentially overshadowing someone who should be in the mouth and the conversations of people when they're chatting about the greatest football of all time? Mm-hmm. I think now we need to be sat here and, and, and learning and educating ourselves on why Roger Byrne is one of Manchester United's greatest ever captains. The mm. records is set for England, and also the, the probably one of the greatest fullbacks to, to wear a United shirt, if, if not if not the greatest. Which I think is a a beautiful mm. conversation to have because you know history doesn't go away; history stays forever. So we need to make sure that we're all informed and educated. Well, look, look um, he's up on, there. On these. We've, we've got Billy Meredith, yeah. we've got Johnny Carey, we've got Roger yeah. Byrne, we've got Brian Robson, we've got Roy Keane. Great, mm-hmm. great, 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 great captains, great men inspirational mm-hmm. leaders mm-hmm. people who have commanded respect bruce mm-hmm. bruce in fairness bruce, steve bruce in fairness as well you, you're bruce absolutely is another one yeah. yeah absolutely absolutely right actually pat in that book page 56 in your book in my book for you which uh, <clears throat> well remembered i just checked it <laughs> <laughs> you done that on the slide but that that I did a, I did a, I did a review, you know, about each of the players. And, yeah, know, there's, it, there's, Rob there's the there. word. I mean, just, just those, just read those words, Pat. About, about. Roger Do you Cameron. want to read it, Pat? Do you want to read it? In, in yeah. Roy Cavanagh's so words, is, in, uh, in the book. And this is the first championship for the Babes, the fifty-five, fifty-six season. Roger Byrne, captain, thirty-nine league, one FA Cup, three goals. When people discuss world-class footballers, particularly for Manchester United, Roger Byrne must demand that recognition. When you consider he is also arguably one of their greatest ever captains, it shows his stature. That he played 33 consecutive England internationals for England before he was killed in the Munich air disaster shows he was first and foremost a brilliant left-back. Led the side through any moment of doubt his calmness, authority and determination made Roger one of the great footballers. Now, Roy, if you had told us that you'd already prepared that piece in a book, we could have saved ourselves about 50 minutes on this show. We could have just <laughs> read that out at the very start and had it done with. <laughs> Pat would be halfway into his sleep and his chicken sandwich. <laughs> yeah, beautiful words as always. <laughs> Beautiful words as always. And do you know what? I, I was thinking this a second ago, Pat. You know who the author is sat here on this panel. Um, I, I loved what Roy said then about Jackie Blanchard, who we're going to chat about next week on this show, next Tuesday, same time. Um, and uh, the 12th man. What a title. The 12th yeah. player. What a title. No, yeah. Or the number 12. Love that. What should we go with, Roy? You're the wordsmith. Well, well Pat, Pat mentioned a guy before, Digger Gardner, Derek Gardner. And Derek's 
Well, I'm 75 this year. Derek must be about 82. And I bumped into to dig it. Tom's done a book for him. Um, well, more than a book. It, it, it's like War and Peace. It's a massive yeah, book. Yeah, I've seen that. Um, so um, uh, I, I had this story about Red Yellen, the, the goalkeeper, which Jackie Blanchflower personally told me. Jackie was um, United's travelling 12th man for the game at Wolverhampton in 1952 in the October I, I, <clears throat> after we'd won the title in the April. So we were the champions and it was the start of the 52 3 season. And Red Yellen um, was a brilliant, brilliant goalkeeper, but he'd had, uh, he'd been a prisoner of war with the Germans actually and finished up in, he got caught in Africa and he, he finished up in a Polish um, um, prisoner of war camp and he suffered terribly. And I, I knew about those type of sufferings because my late father had been with the Japanese and I can still remember him shouting in the middle of the night, just screaming, you know, it, it, it sticks with you. Um, and and Rod, um, Reg Allen had United signed as a world record goalkeeper and he, he'd helped to win the title, but he was having real bad demons. And he came back from, uh, you know, his sort of last chance and they played at Wolverhampton, and Jackie was in the dressing room that day as a 12 man. United were 2 0 up. And at half time, it was 2 2. And Reg Allen, Jackie said, came into the dressing room and he was having a right go. And someone, Busby or someone, said something. And he just stormed out of the dressing room in his kit. And they don't know where he went to. And Busby had to put Johnny Carey in goal in the second half. United lost the game 6 2. <clears throat> but you can't find a record in the newspaper that Reg has gone AWOL because the newspapers were like us three here. So if you've gone AWOL, Ben, me and Pat are covering it. You know, the rest of the show continue. We didn't say Ben's gone walk about. I mean, you know, the reporters. And so Digger, I was meeting Digger and I said, this story about, oh, he said I was there. I was at Molyneux for that game. Bloody hell. I said, did you remember anything funny? Oh, yeah. He said, when Johnny Hancock's got the equaliser to make it 2 2, he said, Red just stood like this on the post. He said, and the ball just went in the other corner. And we're all thinking, what's going on? I thought, cracked it. I said, what happened in the second half, did you? Who, who was in goal? Oh, he said, I can't remember that. <laughs> <And> <laughs> it was brilliant how he, he, he knew exactly something that I'd not given him the story. Do you understand me? He, he was there. He also was there, by the way, at the Arsenal game in 50, 58. He was, a, I mean, and did you remember this? And I thought, I'm on a winner. He's going to confirm that Johnny Kelly did go on. Well, Roy, oh, next right. Tuesday, if you can get him down the pub with you, get your iPad out and let's have him on the show with us. Maybe a <laughs> well, well. <laughs> Then you can both do it over a pint as well. And it'd be a lot more familiar. It'd be a lot more nice. Um, Look, guys, I've got to wrap up really quickly. So we've got about yep. a minute left. Um, so just quickly, a couple of words. Pat, how will you remember the late, great Roger Byrne? Just a few words. Uh, my lasting memory of him will be the iconic last handshake with Rajko Mitic, the Red Star Belgrade mm. captain. Mm. On the pitch, penance in hand, showing utmost respect to each other before they went into battle. That's how I remember Roger Byrne. Yeah, very good. Leader very of men. Good. Roy, what about you, mate? Uh, an irreplaceable footballer for Manchester United Football Club. And hopefully you've learned a thing or two like me today. What a show again. Our Busby Bay specials just keep getting more and more interesting and, and, and more and more brilliant. Thank you so much. Patrick Burns, who does a lot behind the scenes to get these shows together. Uh, chairman of the Manchester Munich Memorial Foundation. And Roy Kavner, M. B E author. Take that on, man. Take it on. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Roy. It's the only thing I can wind you up about. It's the only thing that I can I can have a little a little say about. Even though I don't know why I'm winding you up. What an honor. Um anyway, thank you for coming on, guys, and I'll see you next Tuesday. We'll be chatting about the 12th player, Jackie Blanchflower, next week. Looking forward to that. Speak to you guys soon. Take care. Bye for now. Cheers, Subscribe and like, 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 like